Howdy ladies and gentlemen, this is Lars Schall talking to you. I am an independent financial journalist from Germany and I have been in London recently on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management in Zurich, Switzerland to meet up with some very brilliant minds in the world of finance. For the first part that you are watching now, I had a conversation with Ambrose Evans Pritchard, the international business editor of the Daily Telegraph. Ambrose Evans Pritchard was the Telegraph's Washington bureau chief in the 1990s. From 1999 until 2004, he served as the Telegraph's EU correspondent in Brussels. Ambrose, have we anything solved related to the root causes of the financial crisis 2007-2008? No, um, we're still arguing about it. Nothing's been resolved. We're no closer to any general understanding of it. The Bank for International Settlements says it's caused by excessively low interest rates for the last 15, 20 years. The central banks are to blame and we're doing it again. The monetarists say it was caused totally unnecessarily in 2008 because the Federal Reserve let the money supply collapse and it could have been avoided. You've got the view of kinds of Keynesians that it's caused by the structure of globalization in the world, excess savings in Asia, China saving too much, not spending enough, all these structural issues, none of it's resolved. And here we are back in the same position again, but worse because the debt levels are higher. The debt levels are now 275% in the rich countries and 175 in the emerging market countries. And that's a record for both. So we go into the next downturn even more stretched. Do you think it is then uh, avoidable to have a crash, a real crash, compared to 2007-2008? I wouldn't use that word, but we're stuck in some kind of bad equilibrium. We don't know how to get out of it. If the central banks start raising rates and tightening, it will very quickly trigger a, a crisis. So they, they're trapped and they have to move with extreme care and I don't quite know how we're going to deal with this, but it, it may ultimately require some form of debt jubilee in, down the road. Um, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money, but that's not necessarily that damaging for the economy. Mm. And you are very concerned these days with the debt-driven growth in China. Why so? Well, there's a rule of thumb that when debt as a share of GDP grows by 50% over five years, it triggers a monumental crisis. This is what happened in uh, the United States in the 1920s. Um, it's what happened in Japan in the 1980s. It's what happened in America again before the subprime bubble. Um, China has just doubled that. It's on 100% of GDP in five years. It's, it's increased debt from 9 trillion to about 25 trillion since 2008. This is huge. Uh, that, that increase in debt is as big as the, the US commercial banking system and the Japanese banking system combined. So this is of a global scale. Um, and when you've had that kind of credit growth, you inevitably have all kinds of problems. And the IMF has been um, warning about this in report after report. And you know, we're now seeing the property market rolling over. It's not going to crash because you have a state-controlled banking system. So they're going to, they're going to put some, a floor underneath it. But it'll manifest itself in all kinds of other ways. And I think it's going to be quite difficult for them. And what are the major changes in, in general for China? Well, that, as the IMF said um, you know, in the, 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 this, this week, they're going straight into a middle-income trap is the trap that so many countries have gone into before. You get some very fast growth. You pick all the low-hanging fruit of sort of catch-up growth because you import technology and capital and, and uh, know-how. And you feel great. It looks great. Everybody thinks you're going to go charging off and then you hit suddenly the limit. And uh, that's what's happened to China. They're no longer that competitive. Their productivity growth is, 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 is plummeting. And the IMF warned that their growth will fall to 3% by 2020, 2.5% afterwards, unless they um, sort this out fast. And they've got a demographic crisis hitting, which is going to be just about the worst in the world. Their, their 
workforce is already shrinking. So they're going to have a soaring, aging burden over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, this is going to be very, very serious. And so I don't believe that China will overtake the US this century. But People talk about it in 2020. I, think, I don't think it'll, it will happen, not in our lifetimes, probably not this century, because America is actually now growing 3% again, that rate. And it, if China slows to anywhere near 3 4%, and then goes into a demographic crisis, it will not catch up with the United States in a century. But do you think China has a potential related to its uh, service sector, which is undeveloped compared to the US? Well, you've got the, the Prime Minister Li Keqiang, who's a reformer, he understands all these issues. He's pushing internally within, in the party um, you know, to do all these things. Um, and he's working very closely, by the way, with the IMF and the World Bank, trying to get them to push for it. So it's not as if they don't know. The problem is you've got the Communist Party machinery and a lot of vested interests. A lot of people want to resist it. And, you know, we'll see what they can actually do. There's a lot of talk, but delivering is, is, a, is another matter. Um, it's very difficult to make these kinds of switches um, from a kind of middle-income economy to a developed economy. You need complete free flow of ideas, you need a proper rule of law, you need all these different structures that you have in your country and hopefully we have here. Um, China's a long way from this, um, much further I think than people realize. And what are your thoughts on the fact that China is aligning itself with Russia more and more? Is this, or, or let's say, Back uh, in the 20th century, it would have been the nightmare of people like Halford Mackinder. Well, um, I would put it slightly differently. It, it's obviously in China's interest to have Russia as a vassal state. Mm -hmm. And if Russia is foolish enough to fall into that trap, I wouldn't have thought that's in the interest of the Russian people. On the, one, on the western side, Russia has a declining status quo, pacifist European Union. There's no threat to anybody uh, except to itself. Uh, and on the eastern side, you have this rising force, um, which is a much greater threat to, to Russia. And furthermore, to my knowledge, there's no European country that has territorial claims on, on Russia. But China most certainly does have territorial claims on a large part of of Eastern Russia, which was basically taken from China in the 19th century. And the Chinese have not f f forgotten this. So it's a slightly odd situation that Put Putin should think the enemies, well, enemy is the wrong word, that the, that the colossus he has to deal with is on his west, and it's not, it's on his east. And the, 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 in, the inherent uh, conflict with China uh, is, is developing already in the in Central Asia. You can see it over the control of gas to, uh, supplies, uh, the new pipelines going from Kazakhstan to China, not to Russia, cutting off the Russians from their, the leverage and control they had. This this is this fat battle is being fought out. And if you look at the gas deal that Ch Ch um, Russia signed with China, it's it's completely on the terms of, of China. The price for that gas is. We don't know, but we think it's $350. That's far below the price in Europe. It's probably at the cost of production, which means Russia's not going to make anything out of it. The Chinese have got a wonderful deal, so it's great for them. But the question is, you know, Putin has got himself into the situation where he's relying on the, on the Chinese to, to give him a lifeline. And when he's cut off with all these financial sanctions that shut um, Russian banks out of the global system. Only China can save him. I think the jury is out what China will do. I'm not sure yet that China will provide all this money, all, all the money to replace the West, the West. He's hoping it, but if they do, it'll be on Chinese terms. And there will be very, very uh, crippling terms for Russia. Connected to the situation in the Ukraine, do you support actually the sanctions against Russia? Um, I've never stated uh, my view one way or the other on that. What I have repeatedly written is the new instruments, the arsenal of 
sanctions that the, U the US Treasury has developed are entirely different from previous sanctions. And there's a, a special cell in the US Treasury that's been working on this for about a decade. Um, they tried it out in North Korea and then in, in Iran and in several other countries in other ways, it's been quite successful. And because tr Russia is fairly integrated into the global system now, America has much more leverage. And it has this sort of superpower uh, regulatory control. And the irony, the paradox in all of this is America has never been as powerful economically and financially as it is now because of these mechanisms. And so long as they can get the Europeans and the Japanese and others sort of to go along with it, they can, they can in inflict enormous damage. And so I think this is not fully understood. People assume, because of the crisis in 2008, people thought America was finished. That was a fundamental misjudgment. It, it, was, it was hit by a shock. It's recovered very fast, um, partly because of its energy boom. Um, but the strengths of the country are still there. And so it's the, 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 the shift in the global um, structure of power is not as great as people think. What are your thoughts on the question when the pricing of energy products in oil will end? Is this in the cards in the not very near future, but midterm future? Well, China, um, I think, already prices, it has four trillion dollars of trade annually. I think 18% of this is already in, in one. So it's doing a lot of its trading in its own currency already. Uh, at some point, it would seem perfectly logical, perhaps soon, that you know oil and gas supplies from Russia to China are conducted in one. Um, I don't think the currency in which it takes place makes that much difference, to be honest. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, and also, I, I, I don't think the U.S. would be particularly opposed to this. China taking up this role. I mean, people talk about the exorbitant, exorbitant privilege of having the world's reserve currency, but it's also an exorbitant burden. Yes. Uh, and it's not completely clear whether America gains from it or is hurt by it. And so I don't think that this is a, is a life and death matter for America. And what are your thoughts on the fact that the Chinese are buying huge amounts of gold, we don't know how much, but do they try to strengthen the Yuan with it? Um, my guess is a lot of Chinese are buying gold because they're worried about what's going to happen. Um, they know that there's that the economic system is quite fragile and uh, things can go badly wrong and they don't fully trust the authorities. Um, and so you do what you always do in those circumstances, you get as much gold as you can get hold of. And you are friendly towards the gold? I think it's an, I think it's an absolutely fascinating market. Um, I think it sort of holds governments and central banks to account and makes them honest. I mean, it's a benchmark of value. Um, I don't particularly share the view there's some huge manipulation of the gold market going on. I think, oddly enough, the Chinese have sort of been actually quite encouraging their citizens to acquire gold. So uh, that's something I don't fully understand. Um, uh, but um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, let the gold market live and be as strong as possible. And do you think that gold will make a comeback in the monetary system? Well, it's going to have a problem right now because we're going into uh, a, a phase of Fed tightening. Mm. Um, that's pretty clear. And it could come sooner than people think. And we're going to go into the cycle of rate rises. And gold's not going to like that. So I I I there may be other reasons to buy gold, but you're going into a headwind. Um, for as long as this cycle lasts. So I would be a bit careful. Um, uh, and in terms of what, what might replace a, a kind of a fiat currency system that's gone wrong, I mean, I, I don't think it, I think if anything comes out of it, it could be something more like the Bancor 
Keynes's idea in the 1940s of a commodity-based you know, um, currency base maybe on 30 different materials, including gold, but not just gold. You know, the government of the Chinese Central Bank has talked about this openly. The IMF has talked about it. Um, so I think that's the sort of direction you could go in, maybe some kind of SDR, you know, IMF currency or equivalent, backed by these commodities. That would be the direction I think is possible we might one day go in. And uh, another thing related to gold that you pay attention to is the question, well, we know now where the German gold is, but why is it there and does it have to be there? Do you think it has to be there? Can this, uh, you know, for example, the, the Deutsche Bundesbank says we have it in London and in New York in order to be able to react to a currency crisis. But does it have to be physically in New York and London in order to react to such a crisis? I mean, you know the reason why it was it was moved from Germany because it, the Cold War was too close to the to the front. It basically, Allegedly. was acquired there and never left the place. It was just stored there. Didn't they shift a whole lot of it uh, during the Cold War to get it away from... Uh, no, actually they bought it in the 1950s and the 1960s in New York and in London and left it there. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, there's no reason whatsoever why it has to be in location in London or New York. It could be in Frankfurt. It makes no difference whatsoever. And so you understand that more and more people in Germany are asking to re repatriate the gold. Yes, I mean, for me, what's interesting about it is what it shows about public opinion, it shows about the level of trust between the major Western powers. There should be this mistrust has developed, um, or the mistrust in the governments and the creators of paper currencies, but also the, between Germany and America. Uh, um, it's a very interesting development. And of course, you know, the NSA scandal and all of this, I'm sure, has has made these tensions a little crisper. So you understand that there are some uh, fractions uh, between the US and Germany? My own view is that the US overreacted horribly to the, uh, well, under the Bush administration, it sort of overreacted to the Islamic threat in, a, in an incoherent and indiscriminate way, invading Iraq and so forth, and an incredibly foolish set of uh, decisions were made and greatly damaged America's leadership in the world. And, and we're still seeing a lot of fallout from that. The trust was broken. Um, it was a huge rift with Europe. I was a Brussels correspondent at the time. I was covering NATO and I was covering EU, and I remember all these summits, you know, with the French and the Germans on one side and the uh, Brits and the Americans on the other, and it was a complete and utter mess, and we saw the fractures in the in the Western strategic system being exposed. And we haven't fully recovered from that. And uh, uh, I think it's going to take a long time for America to rebuild that political trust uh, with, with Western Europe and with Germany. And when you have an episode like the NSA and, and spying on Angela Merkel's telephone, obviously you throw it back up <laughs> again. I mean, it's just such a stupid thing to do. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think it's interesting, it's very interesting. I think German public opinion is absolutely fascinating. Uh, and the, you know, the election of AFD, anti-Euro party, you know, there's absolutely extraordinary developments going on, I think, um, you know, it's uh, very interesting. Do you think the Euro was a wrong idea in order to unify Europe? It seems like it uh, does uh, separate Europe. Well. Uh, yes, it was intended to, to lock Europe together, to force, force a quantum leap towards political integration, because you can't hold the euro together without political union. They sort of knew that. So they, they, they jumped ahead of themselves with this, knowing that it couldn't work as constructed and you'd have to have political union. And instead we find that this political union has not actually happened. So you've still got this orphan currency with no unified uh, European treasury behind it, no u u unified European government behind it. Um, it's unworkable. The gap between North and South is not closing. These crisis policies have sort of temporarily covered it up a little bit, but it's fundamentally that rif rift is there. And uh, this is, is, we're going to be in chronic crisis 
probably in various forms of quasi-depression in Europe, until they get rid of the euro. The only way to, for Europe to recover is to break it up. And would you say the European people would need the option, for example, that they can vote for a new European treaty, which has a fiscal union in it, or to go the other way and go to back to their national currencies? Well, uh, yeah. it, it's, it's, they should have had this vote when they launched the euro. Had they had that vote, the German people would have said no, and we would not be in this situation. To do it now, um, in a way you could say it's sort of happening anyway. The, the Front National won the elections in European elections in France, calling for an immediate withdrawal from the euro. I interviewed uh, Marine Le Pen last year, and I said, what's the first thing it will do if you ever become president of France? She said, the first thing I will do is give orders to the French tre treasury to reintroduce the French franc. And this, this would they, be the end. They've just won the election. Mm -hmm. So we're already moving in that, that direction where You know, Britain can leave sort of partly disengaged from the EU and it, the EU can, can continue more or less this, in the same way. But if, if France starts pulling back like this, the whole thing just disintegrates. Yeah, it's the engine with Germany. It's, 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 you know, it's built on the Franco-German pillars. And if, if, if France turns against this project, it's over. And we're halfway there. Another question that I would like to ask you is, what are your thoughts on the fact that more and more people t look at the process, how money gets created and take an issue? We're getting into very complex um, monetary theory and I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I think the Chicago plan uh, that was proposed in the 1930s and which the IMF is now talking about is absolutely extraordinary and it basically is the idea of taking away um, the power to create money from the private banks and uh, handing it back to governments essentially or handing it to governments giving governments some monopoly over it and they believe that through this mechanism you can achieve a lot of things at once including eliminating all the public debt at a stroke just like that and actually turning it into a surplus now this is very complex ter terrain i think this is absolutely fascinating And I think that if, um, if we go into another uh, global downturn with the kind of debt levels we have now, I think all this sort of really avant-garde thinking will become mainstream. And this is the debate we're going to have. But we're not there yet. Yeah. But you would welcome it. Um, we've got to get out of this mess. You know, we, we've, got a, we, we've got a kind of little cyclical recovery going on in, say, in Britain, it's, it's, it's more genuine in America, but fundamentally the world is still st stuck in this low growth trap. Um, you know, the secular stagnation that Larry Summers talks about, we're stuck in this thing, we've got to break out of it. And it may be that if, if we have another downward leg, the unemployment levels are going to be so high in so many places. Um, I mean, can you imagine if, we, if Europe goes back into crisis with unemployment already at 25% in Spain? I mean, I mean, it's just unthinkable. So you then have to start thinking outside the box and, and go radical. Yeah. I mean, another possibility is, of course, what, what Japan did in the 19, early 1930s under, under uh, Takahashi Korikiyo when they, he just ordered the Bank of Japan to fund fiscal, you know, fund the government and build bridges yeah. and build roads uh, and put the money into the veins of the economy. And if we go into another downturn, I think this will also be on the, uh, on the on the table for discussion. I'm not saying we should do it. I'm saying this is, this is what we're probably going to talk about. One last question for our interview. Uh, I know some senior bankers in Germany who tell me on the record and off the record that they do not trust any more data, government data from the US, be it related to inflation, be it GDP or unemployment, or the unemployment rate. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think there is some reason to be skeptical about those numbers? Well, so the question would be, did they used to count them honestly, but have now suddenly started fiddling the numbers? Is that, is that the allegation? 
Well, it, you know that it changed over time. You were in the, in the U.S. during the presidency of Bill Clinton. He changed how uh, unemployment is counted. I think already back in the presidency of Richard Nixon, they changed how they uh, count um, inflation because they kicked out energy. How good is an inflation number that has no energy in it? So, yeah, over time they changed it definitely. And I think um, what I perceive uh, or what I think about American politics is basically that it's perception management. Well, it may be, but it's not going to change the reality of what the Fed is just about to do to America and to the world. Because even under this, the current definitions of unemployment, whether they're real or not real, they're still reaching a level in which the Fed's going to act. You know, the, uh, the unemployment rate in America is now 6.1%. Um, it's reached this point 14 months before the Fed thought it would. So we're, we're, we're at this crucial moment when um, uh, you start getting labor shortages and uh, pushing up wage demands and you get the very beginning of a wage price spiral. And the, f the Fed has suddenly real realized that's going to hit them very soon. And they're going to act. And they're going to act hard. Much harder, I think, than people realize. And they're going to raise rates sooner and harder, um, whatever they say. Um, and this is going to have huge consequences, because America can take it right now, but can the rest of the world. All, the, all these carry trades in dollars, there's $1.2 trillion carry trade from Hong Kong into China. Everybody was playing this game. They thought the dollar would go down against the Chinese yuan, and now it's, now it's going up. They're all getting caught on, on leveraged tr trades to the wrong side. You've got the emerging markets all um, very, very kind of leveraged to the, to the dollar. Many of them are borrowed in dollars, They're corporate companies, not, not, not governments. So this, this could send a, a, a kind of tremor right through the global system. We had a, we had a first um, taste of that last year, the taper tantrum in May. This, we could have it again and it could be bigger when they really do start tightening. I don't think people realize how, how, um, how what stress this could cause in emerging markets. I mean, I've spoken to IMF officials and BIS officials about this and they're very, very worried. They're not sure that, the, that many of these emerging market economies can cope with the, what's about to hit them. And they, they know that huge amounts of money went le leaked into these countries from QE by the Fed and they think quite a lot of that could come out very fast again. As soon as the rates go up in America, the money will swing back. This is the great new risk in the world right now. I mean, economic risk. Okay, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this was our special interview with Ambrose Evans Pritchard. And on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management, I say thank you for watching.